to express or project certain of our psychological states. For example, our evaluative attitudes. Okay, well, this is a, um, a fairly familiar sort of view. What we want to emphasize is that it leads us to a picture with a contrast between vocabularies. On the one hand, there's the scientific vocabulary, which, according to this view, is still doing the job of genuinely representing or referring to or describing the external world. On the other hand, there are the other vocabularies, the ones to which the expressivist treatment is being applied, which, according to this story, don't have a representational or a referential function. And an important point to note here is that this contrast between the two kinds of vocabularies is being drawn in what we can broadly call semantic terms. It's being drawn in terms of, in terms of some notion like truth or reference or some, some notion from that general package. Okay, so this is what, as it were, this is what the world looks like from the expressivist point of view. Uh, and now we can see the distinction between the three kinds of vocabularies on the right of the picture. The first vocabulary, the, the scientific vocabulary, is genuinely referring to things in the world, and that's what the, the grey arrows refer, uh, I mean, represent here, then in their reference relations or something of that kind. Whereas the other, uh, uh, and as you can see, there's, there's, a, there's a term in the scientific vocabulary which is referring to vocabularies. In, in, in the particular example I picked out here, we have a term in, in the scientific vocabulary which is referring to the, to the abstract or mathematical vocabulary. But the abstract or mathematical vocabulary and the normative vocabulary are not involved in the same kind of work. They don't have a representational function. So that's why there are no referential arrows leading from them to anywhere else. So that's the semantic contrast, which seems to be part and parcel of the expressivist picture. Okay, now, here's a puzzle, a sort of challenge for any view of that kind. If that's the right sort of story, then why do the non-representational vocabularies look like or behave like descriptive vocabularies? Why do we talk of moral truths, for example, or mathematical truths, if in reality, as it were, there are the, there's no, those vocabularies don't stand in semantic relations to anything? The distinctive thing about quasi-realism is, is it, that it takes this issue very seriously and tries to show how, starting from the expressivist starting point, that is, starting from some non-semantic account of the function of um, the problematic vocabularies, from that starting point, how we can naturally explain how we come to speak in a in, in quasi-descriptive way, how we come to, as it were, give voice to our evaluative attitudes in what looks on the surface like a, an assetoric or a descriptive form. So that's, that's the distinctive feature of the quasi-realist project. It's, it's, as it were, showing how um, vocabularies which really shouldn't be interpreted realistically in the sense of really referring to something in the world nevertheless look like vocabularies which should be interpreted realistically. Now, one of the, one of the, one of the kind of... Um, one of the virtues of quasi-realism, I think it's fair to say, one of the things that quasi-realism buys us, according to Blackburn, is a defense of ordinary practice. So a reason for claiming that there's, there's no kind of error involved in saying with the folk that there are moral values, or that there are propositions, or that there are numbers. Here's a quote from that same paper. Blackburn says, quasi-realism is most easily thought of as the enterprise of showing why projectivism needs no truck with an error theory. So, unlike the, the kind of view attributed to Mackey, for example, quasi-realism is not the, the idea that, that moral talk involves some kind of error, because, literally speaking, there are no values in the world. One of the distinctive things about quasi-realism is that it, it, I mean, in effect, it says, look, we're, we're not in, entitled to ask that metaphysical question about values, once we understand where value talk comes from, what sort of job it's doing. So the metaphysical question is in itself um, um, a, a reflection of a misunderstanding of the role of value talk from a quasi-realist point of view. 
Okay, so let's have a picture of how the world looks from the quasi-realist point of view. So, in a sense, what quasi-realism gives us is, is kind of a quasi-reference or quasi-truth, uh, which is characteristic of um, the, the problematic vocabularies, in this case, the evaluative and the, the abstract vocabulary. Um, and so there's a contrast between the, as it were, the, the quasi-semantic relations represented by these rather pale arrows here um, connecting, um, c connecting those vocabularies to their quasi-objects. And then the real reference relations connecting uh, the scientific vocabulary to scientific objects. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, a kind of crude representation of the quasi-realist worldview. Okay, now, there are two kinds of challenges um, which um, arise for the quasi-realist. They arise from the fact that, like most other expressivist views in this sort of ballpark, quasi-realism is a local view. That is, it's treating some vocabularies as quasi-descriptive, others as genuinely descriptive. And both of these challenges, the reason we call them global challenges, is that they're challenges to the entitlement that the quasi-realist claims to draw that distinction between vocabularies. So the, and the quasi-realist entitlement to that distinction comes under attack from two directions. There's an internal challenge from, as it were, from within the quasi-realist <coughs> framework. And then there's an external challenge from more general considerations. And it's that external challenge which Blackburn himself is really concerned with in the paper with which we began. But we want to say something first about the internal challenge. And here's a kind of um, a rough characterization of this internal challenge. Something we could say to Blackburn. We could say, look, suppose you succeed in explaining on expressivist foundations why non-descriptive claims behave like descriptive claims. If these explanations work in the hard cases, such as moral and aesthetic judgments, then surely they'll work in the easy cases too. That is, for things like scientific judgments. In which case, the claim that the easy cases... Sorry, I, yeah, I mean the easy cases. In which case, the claim that these easy cases are genuinely descriptive, rather than, like the other cases, merely quasi-descriptive, seems, first of all, an idle cog, not needed an idle cog in the sense that it's not needed to explain our use of terms like true and false in association with the scientific vocabulary, the vocabulary that the quasi-realist wants to treat as genuinely descriptive. And secondly, it seems to be a kind of methodological inconsistency, given that what the, the quasi-realist is offering us in the in the in the hard cases, the quasi-realist is offering us, in effect, an expressivist account of the use of the semantic vocabulary in association with such things as evaluative vocabulary and um, mathematical vocabulary. So in a sense, the, what the quasi-realist is doing is adopting the expressivist standpoint, not only with respect to the first order problems, the evaluative vocabulary or, or whatever, but also with respect to the semantic vocabulary and saying that, look, if we do that, if we, if we apply this expressive stance to the semantic vocabulary, then we give it, get an account of um, what that vocabulary is doing in association with such things as moral judgments. And the point here is that there's a kind of method, a methodological inconsistency or discontinuity if the quasi-realist is not prepared to continue that same expressive stance with respect to the semantic vocabulary when it gets to the application of the semantic vocabulary to um, what we're here calling the easy cases, such things as the scientific vocabulary. Okay, so in a nutshell, the challenge is, look, quasi-realism seems to be almost inevitably a victim of its own success if it is successful, because the program that it's offering us for the hard cases can be extended to the easy cases too, in which case it loses this distinction.